Hello everyone, welcome to Genealogy Adventures. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. How are you guys today? Hopefully you guys are having a blessed Sunday, enjoying the good weather, if you're having good weather where you are. Yeah, it's not that bad outside. No, it's a little bit muggy, a little bit. But, yeah, you get high. It could be worse. <laughs> you said it could be worse. <laughs> We're back in the studio again, and, you know, we kind of heard some feedback about another location in the studio, so... So we've been moved. So we've been moved, so no more flashing lights, so hopefully that's going to be good. Yes, and guys, look at these gold and silver records. Like, I'm telling you, when you get the opportunity to come to Lip Listen Vision to just view the House of Hip Hop, you need to come and view it. It's it's actually very awesome. Afiba, aren't you guys moving to another... Um, location. Location? Yeah, so I'm not sure exactly when they're doing that, but they are. Okay. All right. Yep. So once they get that information, we will definitely let you guys know. But this is an awesome, everything about it is awesome. So I'm a hip hop head. So we're going to switch things up today. And today, Donnie is going to introduce our wonderful guest. Yes. So today we will be talking with Adrian Fikes. Adrian is the Soul Power Coach, a seventh generation Virginian and creator of the Joy Genealogy Justice Community Building Framework. Adrian is a speaker, author, organizational development consultant and co-founder of Racial Justice Alexandria. Her her16greats.com challenge is to speak your 16 great great grandparents names. So welcome Adrian, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Oh, we're so happy to have you on the show and I just wanted to say I caught your YouTube video. It was a TED Talk on this very subject and it was a really entertaining video. First of oh, all, I'm so glad. <laughs> First of all, I am so feeling to speak your great great grandparents' names. I'm I'm in it to win it. So I I, mm. I absolutely love that. Well, the part that made me laugh is right in the beginning. Adrian's like, "Yeah, y'all have 16 great grandparents. I don't know how many of you actually knew that." <laughs> <laughs> teach them, Adrian. So teach us. Show us. <laughs> So, if you'd like to talk a little bit more about the, the kind of advocacy work that you're doing, and I guess it falls under the, the term mentoring, right. um, the, the mentoring work that, that you do, because we both find that really fascinating. Yes. Wonderful. So, there, there, are, there are a whole bunch of things that I'm doing, and, you know, when you're on team doing too much, and it all just kind of converges into a thing. So, I made a framework <laughs> to justify while I'm all over place because there's really a wonderful connection between it all. Um, I am a professional coach by trade um, and a credentialed uh, coach and I am in the business of helping people understand who they are to be uh, making purposeful decisions and to really stand up in a way that they are showing up in their life where they are decisive, they have clarity and they are allowing their unspeakable joy to flow. And what I'm, what I also noticed was, you know, oftentimes people talk about living your best life. Well, you can't really be living your best life if you are oppressing other people, if you are harming other people. Mm. Um, and so I have gotten into the coaching has started encouraging people to do genealogy through my own exploration of my family. Um, and I also work with a civic advocacy program here within the city of Alexandria that teaches parents to um, influence and shape public policies to make their children's lives better. Well, actually, that makes a lot of sense, because in order to really appreciate what you've inherited from your family history and from the past, you have to have a really good grounding and understanding of who you are right now. Is that one way of looking at it? Absolutely. And that is, that is where the joy genealogy and justice framework comes in. You know, it starts with understanding who you are. You know, I, I, Ella Baker is one of my heroes. And what she said was strong people don't need strong leaders. And so, you know, you also have heard the thing about, you know, being the weakest link in the chain. Um, and so from an organizational development perspective, I start with the individual. And then we look at who you are in your relation to other people, you know, so personal growth and then family history, you know, who you are, who you come from, who your ancestors were, civic engagement. Um, you know, it's interesting, particularly for, for Black Americans, if you tell the story of your family, 
somewhere in there is an arc where it says, and then this public policy happened, or then this harm happened, and it stopped them, or it killed them, or it slowed them down, or they overcame it, and you know now they're successful, or you know it was a tragic end. So the piece of civic engagement, what are the public policies that are either lifting their family or oppressing them? Um, and then what are you doing about it? You know, how are we looking at the harm of the past and its evolution into where we are today? Um, and, and so that's my focus on racial justice. Um, so, and then legacy building. So now that I know all of this stuff about my family, how am I sharing this with the descendants of future generations so that they don't, they don't have to continue repeating the same patterns. They don't have to continue fighting the same fight. Which is such a smooth, it's the, like the most smooth segue into the topic of the show. I, right. You would have thought we actually rehearsed that segue. <laughs> we, we didn't. Um, so actually today's show is about reframing the narrative in terms of researching enslavers. Right. And Adrian, what has, what's the journey been like for you in terms of researching your enslaved ancestors? So it, it's, and I always talk about the range of emotions. Yeah, I fell into this. I, I have, after the 2016 presidential election, I actually saw a tweet <laughs> that mentioned something about the area where I learned about my family, where oh. I knew my family was from. Mm -hmm. And, and, where, and falling, where was that? I'm sorry? And where was that? So it was a tweet about, um, a, a road somewhere, I think it was around Henderson, North Carolina, where there were, um, the tweet said that there were Klan supporters walking across the bridge celebrating the presidential election. Mm -hmm. um, a reporter had debunked that. They said they weren't Klan supporters, they were Trump supporters. And I said, oh, okay. But in his article, he mentioned um, Chatham County, North Carolina and an incident between the North Carolina state militia and the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and I had just recently found out that my great grandfather had been, had come from Chatham County, North Carolina. Um, and that's pretty much all she wrote. I fell down the rabbit hole. I found some cemeteries. I found some names. I found some documents. And uh, I have been obsessed with my family history ever since. Mm -hmm. Falling down that rabbit hole is something else because I know yes. everybody has had their own way of falling down that rabbit hole. I was always afraid of ghosts and bumps in the night and all that other stuff. So my way of falling down that rabbit hole was actually through the living. And mm -hmm. it was me just like really getting into who my family were. And then once I found out, you know, the number of how large my family was, I was like, okay, well, I've done the, the, the living, let me do the dead. And that's how I fell down that rabbit mm -hmm. hole. And mm -hmm. I fight to get out sometimes. <laughs> Stop fighting it. Yeah. Stop fighting it. <laughs> you gotta just float. It sucks. <laughs> you just don't know. <laughs> oh. So sorry, I did jump in there. You were um, telling us about the, what the journey in terms of researching your enslaved ancestors were like, and we're going to probably cycle back to Chatham and to Henderson. Oh yeah, we are. Because <laughs> we, have, we well, have connections to both of those places, but this is about oh, you. Oh, fantastic. This is about yeah, you no. and, and your journey. Hey cousin. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, actually Chatham, what was interesting is, you know, I, I participated in a family reunion of my great grandfather, his four brothers and their descendants. And so I knew there, you know, are for going forward who, who we were and, you know, where we came from, but nobody could tell us who our parent, who their parents were. Um, and so in falling down that rabbit hole and asking questions, you know, it's all, it takes one question <laughs> to, to get tripped up and fall down that rabbit hole. Um, I stumbled upon cemetery records of my great grandfather and my grand, wow. my grandfather, my great grandfather, and on the records of my great grandfather, his parents' names were listed right there. Mm. Um, that was a, that, and it was so easy. It was literally a couple of keystrokes because you know genealogy, technology being what it is. That then the next question was, well, if this was so easy, who are my other great great grandparents out there, and and how easy would it be to find them? Wow. Yeah, I'm not into the like I said. 
I, I mean, I love genealogy. Don't get me wrong, but they're, you know, getting sucked into them the way that we do. We have to figure out a way to pull ourselves out. I know some people don't agree with me on that, but we do. Like right now, I've pulled myself out mm. because mm. I have to get ready for 1950. Yeah. And that's why I've pulled myself. I have a lot of people that contact me. Hey, can you help me research this and this and the third? Um, no. And that's just really all that I can say is no, because I have to get myself prepared for the 1950 census, and and I, I don't I don't research. Well, we had a rabbit hole yesterday afternoon that I refused to go down <laughs> because I had two client reports that I had yeah. to write yesterday. I yeah. had to do it. Yeah, and it was and it was a rabbit hole. One um, person said that she and I fell down the rabbit hole. Ben, Benita Gale Gibbs, she said, I fell down the rabbit hole, evicted the rabbits, and took up residence. <laughs> so, <laughs> you gonna live there. <laughs> Come out for air, though, Benita. Come out for air. <laughs> you know, so, one of the things I noticed is our ancestors, I, I, they, they pull us in. Yes, they do. They call, they call us back. Yes, and they so do. And so, I've become comfortable with the ebb and flow of it. You know, when I found an 1841 uh, estate record with my great great grandfather listed as a 14 year old slave and you know valued at $383 you know that I had to step away I, I I didn't know how to process that I didn't want to believe it these things and this is the the reason why I want to reframe the narrative because we really have to think about the microaggressions, the harm, the pain, the fear that comes with doing ancestry when you are descendant of Black Americans. So mine's going to be a two-part question, kind of a, okay. a follow-on. So in order to reframe the narrative, and we're going to talk a lot more about what that entails and how you see that, what kind of narrative do you think is out there already that needs to be replaced? Or, re or actually not replaced, reworked and refinessed. Reworked and refinessed. You know, it, mm -hmm. that's, that's a great way to put it because I think there's a lot of wonderful work happening between researchers, people who are researching and finding out that they descend from enslavers and people who are finding out that they descend from people who were enslaved. Um, and then there is a whole other evolution of people who descend from people who did harm, who, who perpetuated racial justice since then. And oftentimes the narrative is around um, making it a safe space, uh, making people comfortable with the conversation, um, not upsetting white people, not allowing black people to be angry, you know, deal with your emotions before you come in here. And I think that that um, is well-meaning, but I think it also perpetuates the harm that we can experience. They're like booby traps. You just never know when it's gonna pop up if you're doing this research. And I would love to see the community begin to be more intentional about the way that we're centering the people who descend from this harm, from this oppression, from this injustice. You know, that's what that's what I should have said in the last presentation that I gave this week. Um, to cut a very long sh story short, I was giving a presentation about how to research um, enslaved, well, basically African American ancestry from slave ship to living descendants. And at the end of that ninety minute um, presentation and conversation, um, a white gentleman asked me about an enslaver's two wives and had I noticed a strange coincidence involving both of his wives. And my reply was, and I think this is almost word for word, it's like, I don't mean this to sound nasty against the enslavers, but I don't care because I'm researching the enslaved people. And it, it was a question that really kind of threw me because if you're spending 90 minutes talking about the difficulty of going from a slave ship to, to, living, people, to living people and all of those generations and all of those processes, why are you going to ask me? Now, if you the gentleman had asked me about probate records or what kind of enslaved enslavers records were helpful. Fine with it. That would that's a legit that was would have been a totally fine question. Right. But to ask me something about 
that may or may not be interesting about the enslavers personalized themselves. Right. That's mm-hmm. not central to what I'm doing. Right. But the one of the things that I found that's been an issue, and you might want to speak on this, Adrian, mm-hmm. is how black people nowadays they really don't care what white people, how white people feel. And that's fine. That's fine. Because everything that you've gone through, you know, that you, and the search that you've gone through, you notice what your family went through. So you're, Mm. you're so somewhat, you're angry about it. But, and, and there is a, but Mm. these people went through some stuff too. I know, I know that, Everybody gets upset at me when I say these things, but Brian and I was talking about this yesterday, how genealogy is a common sense based research. And because it's common sense based, you have to understand that yes, black people had it bad. They had it bad, 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 bad. But can you imagine sending your children, your six and seven year old child to a horror film? And that's what they did. That's what these little that's what these little white children went through. They went through a horror film, but they didn't know it was a horror film. So just like we have certain things going on with us, we have the epigenetics with us and we, you know, the 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 bounce back cuz a police officer them pulled us over or something like that. They have those same things, it's just in a different manner. We can't sit here and look at stuff and think that it's only happening to us when it actually happens to everyone. Does that make sense? Yeah, I hear what you're saying. And and here's here's where here's where I would, would challenge this. So I don't think that it's about black people being angry or even hating white people. But what I think that it's about is the way the structural white supremacy works in this country. So we are literally conditioned to care about white people, make them comfortable, make them happy, make them feel safe, take care of them. And this is in every aspect of our lives. And so it's not unusual in a genealogy conversation that, you know, Brian would give a 90 minute talk about the enslaved people and the first question is yeah well what about the white guy's wife like it, it's no different than going to a hollywood movie you know you you saw black panther it was a movie about a, an all black kingdom and they had to find a sympathetic white guy to insert in there so that white people could relate because we're conditioned to relate to the sympathetic white person we're conditioned to have sympathy for the sympathetic white person and i'm not interested in necessarily being angry or um, revengeful, what I'm interested in is the truth. Right. Mm. And, and the truth of this is, look, the white supremacy was established in this country to protect a small segment of wealthy white people. And so the collateral damage that they have um, inflicted on their descendants and their families in order to protect their wealth is just that. But their wealth was built on the bones of our ancestors. It's, so it's not the same thing. It, it, and, and so the, many of the policies that you've seen evolve out of this are evolving because you know, look at what's happening today. White people are afraid that black people will get power and then black people will inflict upon white people the harm that for centuries we have been enduring. When the reality of this situation is most of the black people that I've ever encountered just want to be unbothered. Oh yes. Well yeah, I mean and I and I agree with that, but in the same instance, I still can't sit here and say that because of what they did, it's just collateral damage. I feel like as a person, as a human being, that's that's not fair. Or is so, the other side of what you're saying is because we've met so many of our white DNA cousins, and we actually know, and we who, know who they are. We know who the common mm-hmm. ancestors are, and we know that the the trauma that they feel because they know that their ancestors enslaved our ancestors who were their kin. Right. So we can't, I mean, I'm not like, I I can. That's what you're, that's that's, where you're coming from. That's where I'm coming from. Like I can call some of my white 
um, family members. I can call Susan Yelton. I can call Marshall and we will sit and we will talk and we have this conversation that you and I are having right now. We can actually have this conversation without anger, without mm -hmm. fuss, without me trying to sugarcoat or color or, or coat, you know, make sure that they're okay. I don't have to go through all that, but I find that with those that do feel that way, I don't do that with them either. I'm not. I'm not sugarcoat nothing. I'm oh, no, going. That's, well, that's their journey. And that you know, I'm going to. But I'm talking about like when we did the the Martha Brooks thing, and they would lend their 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 words mm -hmm. and feel all upset. I'm not going to sugarcoat absolutely nothing. I'm going to tell you how I feel, but I'm going to tell you how I feel, in in the best way that I can to let you understand that. I really don't give a crap about what you're going through or how you're feeling about it. Well, not that I don't give a crap about how you're feeling about it, but just that I don't, I don't care. What am I trying to say, Brian? Well, because <laughs> it's diff it's difficult to try to take care of someone else's kind of emotional, when I'm trying emotional to deal with my own right spiritual stuff. When you're trying to deal with, when right. we're trying as a people to to deal with our own. Right, and that's why we have this show because mm -hmm. I need for people of non-melanated skin to understand that our our needs do come in this. Yeah. And yes, I acknowledge what you've gone through. I see what you've gone through, but I've gone through it too. Which I'm going to say that is actually better. It's still awkward, but it's better than the usual response I get, which is get over it. Slavery was hundreds of years ago. Right. You don't you don't know any enslaved people. Right. And I'm sure that and I'm sure Adrian, you've probably heard variations of those comments yourself. Right. And that's what goes into the truth that she's talking about. So, because when you push that truth out to them that we're like only one or two generations removed from slavery and it happened to have been my grandparents or my great grandparents, guess what? I did know someone in slavery. Or, you know, or know someone, or who, know knew someone, someone who, who knew someone, someone yeah. who was enslaved. So I need you to know your history first. And that's what I look at that as. Does that make sense, Adrian? I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I'm curious. You've got this relationship with the, with, what did you call it? The, this white descendants, yes. like relatives yes. within yes. your family. You know, do, do your other family members feel the same way? Do they have that same relationship? Um, on, well, actually, my brother, my sister, and I met our Sheffy cousins, um, who were the enslavers of our, both the enslavers and kinspeople of our Sheffy ancestors. Um, and we've all developed a really good relationship with them. Well, we developed it on Facebook first, then we met in person, had an uncomfortable first 20 minutes, and then after that, uncomfortableness went away, and the conversation started. And um, they're family now. They consider us family, and we consider them family. For me, That's there wonderful. is one, which is Candace. Mm -hmm. And Candace actually traveled from Washington State just to meet us. Uh, she did come and meet, and there were some family members that were there. However, there are some that are not interested. <laughs> but in my opinion, and I love my family, I feel like they need to learn the history before you start passing judgment. That's just overall. Mm -hmm. It's an overall thing. You need to know just the overall history. Don't automatically assume certain things before you start passing judgment. That's, that's how I feel about that. Now, other parts of my family, like my Patrick Henry cousins and my Thomas Jefferson cousins, mirror more of what Donnie was talking about. There's a core who are very progressive, right. who love it, embrace it, consider us family, and we consider them family. There are very conservative members of the both families who despise the fact that we even know that we're related. Yep. They do. And they don't hold so, back and they don't hold back on that. Yep. So a couple of things about that. And this is the way that I approach it. I, I think we need to stop talking about slavery as if it was past tense. Oh, I agree. I, I think the evolution of slavery is still with us in this moment mm, today. Mm. And so to say, you know, I didn't own slaves or to say I feel guilty or I'm so sorry for what my ancestors did, I'm not responsible for it, separates us from the evolution of that harm that is continuing to perpetuate itself today. 
And so it's a wonderful thing to think that you and some siblings, maybe some extended family, have this relationship with people that are a descendant of the people who enslaved you. But the, mm. that's an interpersonal relationship. And so when you think about the joy genealogy and justice framework that I'm talking about, you know, you've done the personal work, you've found, done the family history, you know, you are now connecting with others that understand this and you're engaging them, you know, publicly. And the challenge becomes the levels of white structural white supremacy need to be understood. So me doing that inner work of resolving the anger or the pain or processing my feelings, that's, that's an internal process. Me reaching out to, and I've had conversations with people who descend from the family that enslaved my ancestors. It was a wonderful conversation, but it was just that. They had information that I, you know, was asking about and they were willing, you know, I had to hope they were willing to give it to me and they gave me what they could. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's institutional. So if you have a great relationship with this white person that, it's, that, that descends from the enslavers and both of you walk into the bank with matching credit scores and employment and income, who's going to get the better loan? Exactly. But I'm going to say, I'm gonna say in two of our cousins' defense, Missy and Carolyn, <laughs> they, would, they would call that bank manager out. Yes, they would. They would drag, we, no, they yet, wouldn't call him out. They, they would, would drag, drag him. him. They would literally <laughs> drag him like it would not be pretty. <laughs> we, need, we, need more, we need more people willing to, like, to, do that. to drag, so to speak. Yes. But the challenge becomes if your cousin is needed to be with you at the bank mm. for you to get that loan, it's then ridiculous. there's a problem. That's right. Yeah. There's a problem. And I agree with you on that one. And I don't want anybody to think that I do not have the empathy for what our families went through. I did. But I think I, I do. Not I did, I do. But I think I ruined myself. And I said that's in the book. I really think I ruined myself because when I first started researching, like I said, when I fell down that rabbit hole, I fell on the rabbit hole for the living, not for those who had passed on. And then I went to the ones that passed on. So before I even started going to the ones that passed on, I began to tell myself, Donya, you're going to find rape. You're going to find... Um, incest. You're going to find an enslaved member. You're going to... I told myself everything that I was going to find so that I could definitely prepare myself for it and I really think I may have over-prepared myself. I don't think it's bad that I that I might have over-prepared mm -hmm. myself because I'm able to talk to people the way that I do yeah. and I don't have the um, I don't have the cut cards with it Cause I'm going to tell you how I feel like without any hesitation, I'm going to tell you and, and you going to speak my great, great grandmother's name. I say that all the time. Her name is Martha Brooks. Learn it, know it, love it. That's her name. And you know, all of them, Martha, Katie, all of them, all those ladies that took me, that, that literally live mm -hmm. inside of me today. But in the same instance, I am not going to just act like, they didn't exist and what they went through and no, no more so than I'm not going to act like that what those little kids. Because when I think of the lynchings and you see those pictures of those children standing right there in front of those lynchings, that breaks my heart. That it, it just does. It breaks my heart. And it breaks my heart that those men and women were lynched. And that they were used as target practice. And that the whole thing, I have an overall empathy for everything. It's not just one particular, I can't pick and choose. I'm unable to do that. And I don't know, people might be mad at me because of it, but I really think that it's the reason why I've gotten as far as I've gotten with my research and able to talk to people the way that I do. Like, if you can't take it, then don't talk to me. Because I'm going to give you the straight up. But, yeah, that's where I am. So I, I would just, my perspective is a bit different in that there's not an either or choice. It's not about, I either have to, you know, 
deal with you is it's about recognizing the humanity of people and it's also about challenging the way structurally we are still attacking the dignity and humanity of black people um and and so no matter how wonderful they may be you know your your white cousins may be no matter how down they are to run a bank manager you know come roll up and see about him the reality of the situation is the, there's generational wealth being stolen from us. There's dignity and humanity being stolen from us today. Yeah. And, and not knowing the truth because we not only don't teach the truth, but if you are in a position of privilege, you're not even required to notice that what you think is not the truth. And so not only do you have to be open to be challenged by the truth, you have to be willing to listen to the truth and process the truth and then it's your responsibility to do something about that truth. Which and is- and so I what I'm what I'm hoping to see in reframing is that we are prioritizing prioritizing the dignity and humanity of black lives because the inhumanity that you are talking about what would it take for me to take a toddler on a picnic and roast an individual mm. human being you know, their hatred and fear and greed not only dehumanitizes them, but it oppresses and harms us. And, what I and so the way we move through that is by centering Black liberation and humanity in our structural policies, in our institutional, you know, efforts, and in our interpersonal, it's a it's a very awkward thing. You know, I'm I'm first generation Columbia, Maryland. I grew up in this planned community where you know you there it was written into the housing um, contracts that you could not ask about the color or the the religious background of the people that were living next door to you when you were purchasing the home, and so it, the community was designed to be racially and economically diverse. And so growing up as a child, I got to experience this social experiment, this social experiment um, of racial and economic integration. And so it's not unusual for me to say, you know, it, 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 we, we thought I was courageous in the seventies to be like, oh, I have, you know, some of my very best friends are black people. Oh, I have white friends. That's that's not courageous. That's not even really the beginning of the conversation. The beginning of the conversation is I recognize whiteness as an institution and a policy, and whether I am black, whether I am white, whether you know I immigrated here from another country, I'm actively doing something to dismantle the harm that is perpetuated by that system. And I haven't really thought of a good way of actually explaining it this way. My feeling is that a lot of the negative associations with blackness has everything to do with the internalized guilt, guilt, shame, and fear of white people that they don't want to own. Yes. So they displace that onto us. Sorry for psychology 101. I can't think of an easier way of actually. But that's what it is. It's a displacement. That's exactly what it is. And 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 again, Adrian, I hope you see that I'm not disagreeing with you. Um, I actually. I do agree with everything that you're saying. I agree with everything that you're saying. I just think our pro, our approach is is different. But I agree completely, totally, wholeheartedly. In my opinion, you know, genealogy is what brought me to the brought me to where I am. Where I feel like, in order for them to learn, they need to do this. Genealogy should be in school so they mm-hmm. can understand exactly what it was that their ancestors did and how it affected not just our ancestors, but theirs, you know, how it, it just affected mm-hmm. everyone as a whole. Everybody got affected by it, and you need to know that and you need to understand that because you weren't taught that my, that I was actually a part of history, you now think that you're superior over me. And I'm supposed to be in the background when in actuality, 
That same person that you learned was your great 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 grandfather. Guess what? He was mine too. And I and and I'm a part of that. And not only am I a part of that, I had some other people that did some other stuff that was really really great. And you didn't get the opportunity to learn that that we were on the same level. And those are the things that I feel are missing. They need to understand. And the only way they learn it to me is right now through genealogy because they're not teaching it in school. No. Well, again, well, this is always the basic question. If white people did everything in America, why did you need to bring our ancestors? What, what, what am why I did, here for? Why did you need to bring our ancestors <laughs> here in the first place? If your people did everything, yeah, we, shouldn't, what, what we am, shouldn't be here. What we am I here for? Over, we should be over there. I should be at home in my kicking feet in the water doing whatever I do. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm. playing at the pool or something. I ain't got to right. be here. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's really why I started. Even This is a great Thing. This is why I started the 16 grades challenge, because asking those questions, who were your grandparents' grandparents, mm. leads you to begin uncovering this history. I, I would love to see genealogy. Be, I, I have incorporated it into the coaching work that I do, and I would love to see this a part of um, the way that we teach, the way that we educate um, current and future generations. You know, Brian, you talked about Psych 101. And I'm like, this is not, it, it, it's not by happenstance. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in, you think about Nat Turner's rebellion was what, like 1830 something. Mm -hmm. And so the institution of, well, you know, we'll start with uh, you guys, I, Rick Murphy's uh, book about the first Virginians, mm -hmm. uh, the first Africans in Virginia and the 1705 Virginia slave codes and how they were written to, in response to the lifetime achievements of those Angolans. You know, this is needs, to, you know, I keep saying, stop treating this like it's a secret. Put it out in the open, tell people, you know, I'm telling everybody to read that book. Like you need to understand that this is what's happened. You know, I live in Virginia. And so our general assembly is the evolution of the body that created mm -hmm. those Virginia slave codes. And so when Nat Turner rebelled and all of a sudden we couldn't keep black people on the plantation and this institution began crumbling, we, the, our country began to criminalize blackness. And so we became, we were useful and we were property and then we became dangerous mm. because if they couldn't enslave us, they, we, they didn't need us anymore if they couldn't oppress us. And so there was a um, psychologist uh, in the mid 1800s that proposed that black people who wanted to be freed from chattel slavery had a mental illness. And so there's this, this you see this, this, it, it's like a, um, a, a, a campaign against blackness. And what I've discovered is there was a black asylum that started in 1865. You know, just before the end of the, the Civil War in Richmond, there was a black and a sane asylum. And that place is now Central State Hospital. They moved it down to Petersburg. But if you go to their website and you look at the history behind Central State Hospital, what it says is the population growth tracked, started exploding after emancipation. And you have to question, well, was this, did black people suddenly get free and go crazy? Or was it that the sheriff's office could call you crazy if you got into a dispute with a, a white man over, you know, the, the price of your crops and they could institutionalize you? Was it that you, you know, I ended up finding a descendant of, excuse me, an ancestor who died at this hospital. And so now we're uncovering what happened to him. Why was he there? And it wasn't just you had a stroke and all of a sudden, you know, the, your family can't take care of you. Right. It's you survived the Great Depression trying to feed your family in a city like Norfolk, Virginia, that was incredibly racist. And the deaths and the problems and the poverty, you know, there are so many of our ancestors that were broken by this institution. Yes. And so looking at the harm that is continuing to be perpetuated is not about hating white people. And it's not about us um, even, it's about us getting to a place where we're comfortable 
with the truth of the matter that this harm was intentionally designed and that as much as we've designed racism to be systemic, we can design Black liberation. And as much as people are afraid of, you know, the movement for Black lives and their policy platform about how we create Black liberation structurally, this is the cure for the, the guilty white person who's crying because they know they enslaved, you know, their ancestors enslaved people. This is the cure for the person who thinks it's okay to teach their child to hate other people. Hmm. So I'm going to follow that up with my frustration usually gets expressed as anger, but it it really is frustration that not only do we not have a a common framework to have this conversation or to discuss slavery or enslavement or being a descendant of either party, either enslaved or the enslaver, it's the, the attempt to erase or to just make it impossible to have that conversation. And I'm talking about in real time, the misinformation about Black Lives Matter and BLM, yeah. the gaslighting about what who was responsible for the 6th of January when the Capitol was overrun yes. by terrorists, mm-hmm. and that's what I'm going to call them, and then how all of that seems to wrap around to be our fault. Right. When we had absolutely nothing to, to do, do with it, it whatsoever. Not at all. So, I mean, how do we call out, and I mean call them out constructively, and I'm going to say his name again, Mitch McConnell talking about critical race theory, which the way that, and this isn't about all Republicans and all GOP members, because I know that they're not all racist or white supremacists, but how do we, how do we com- combat language? How do we combat, you know, to actually tell people what critical race theory really is and how what we're talking about right now is not it's CRT. It's not CRT. <laughs> you know, if, if, because well, I know that if any Republican of that ilk were to be watching this episode, oh, there this they go with that C- right. yes. CRT all yes. over again. They them. would, they would. And this isn't CRT, and it's not BLM. But this is history. This is history, and they're trying. In my opinion, this is their way of stopping to learn about history because BLM, black and white genealogists who support this kind of re- um, research and everything, they're all saying. This is not CRT. They're all telling them this is not that. And you need to have this conversation. And they won't have it. Because that's the only way that this country will actually ever heal. Right. Is having the conversation that it has postponed since 1622. Hey, now. You know what? It's, 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 this, and and again, it goes, it gets back to the, the framework. It, asking the questions, can you name your great, great, grandparents because the whiter and the wealthier you are the more likely you already know this information and so getting a larger segment of this community to begin asking these questions who do you come from and what was their story you know the, the, because what you're going to get to see is somebody's grandfather came home from the war got the gi bill bought a house was not run out of that house by the clan, passed that house on to his family. And now, you know, there's a there's a 20 something year old buying a first time home in this housing market that's getting a fifty thousand or hundred thousand dollar or more down payment from the family because they have the generational wealth to give it to them. Mm-hmm. I mean, these things have real life implications and there's not a political ad you will ever see for any campaign that somebody doesn't start with their origin story. I was a son of a sharecropper. <laughs> or I, you know, my dad was a coal miner and now I'm running for whatever office mm. because we understand that family history shapes who we are and where we come from and what we have and what we have access to today. And, again, and so if, if we're really talking about, <clears throat> and I, and I make a distinction between, and I don't know, cause I'm not a part of that ecosystem, but when I talk about, Black Lives Matter, I'm talking specifically, I make a distinction to the movement for Black Lives policy platform. And Mm -hmm. and what I keep saying is if this policy platform had come out of Brookings Institution, we would you would be hearing all about it. And yet it came from an evolution of civil rights leaders across the country 
you know, former SNCC veterans and, and, and lawyers and, and economists and, you know, grassroots activists and organizers came together and put this entire comprehensive policy platform together to say, this is how we move forward. You know, so here in Alexandria, we're doing the um, Community Remembrance Project that is um, associated with the Equal Justice Initiative. And in reading this, the documents and doing this, this history, I discovered that there were 12 African-American men who went down to the jail the night that Benjamin Thomas was about to be lynched to try to stop the lynching. And they were armed <laughs> and they said, Justice is going, you know, we're going to do this peacefully. We're going to. And so the city of Alexandria as an institution arrested them, disarmed mm. them, and then sent these black men to the chain gang for 30 days for demanding justice. Well, isn't that for, what they did for Tulsa? Well, you know what? The city of Alexandria, we, I guess this, the city of Alexandria was too integrated in money to actually burn the black neighborhood down. But I also know that the, there, was, there were riots in the city of Alexandria and there was an intentional decision by the newspapers not to write about it. Well, again, what and, you, oh, so sorry, this gets lost to history. And huh. again, what you said just reminded me, this really is going on today. Again, mm -hmm. black farmers got left out of the previous administration's farming saving yeah, package for, for COVID. So the current administration felt that they needed to redress that, that shortfall. Right. What did those GOP, those, the ones they you can it. always count on? Screaming, reverse racism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why do black people get special, well, we get special treatment because you don't do what you're supposed, supposed to, do. to do the first time around. Yeah. If you had done, if the Trump administration had done what they were supposed yeah. to have done fairly yeah. for everyone, and that's why we wouldn't, even need to, we wouldn't even need to have to have that conversation. Exactly, and that's why it's considered special treatment. When in actuality, it's not special treatment. You just you just left this out. Mm -hmm. So because right. you left this out, now we got to go this route, and now it looks like it's special treatment. Yeah. Get, 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 I'm gonna start cussing. So okay, you know what? <laughs> you know what? For the past for the past year, every Saturday afternoon, I've been tuning into YouTube to watch uh, Professor Greg Carr from Howard University, he's the Africana Studies and a law professor at Howard, um, talk to Karen Hunter about Black history, American history, the truth that is exactly what we're talking about, and. You know, Dr. Carr has been putting, they call it in class with, in class with Carr. And he's been teaching us every Saturday. You know, they, they, I think they did the 70th episode this past week. Um, but one of the things that I took away from this is there was, a, there was a man named Neely Fuller Jr. who said, until you understand white supremacy, what it is, how it works, and what it does, everything else you think you understand will just confuse you. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about environmental justice, it doesn't make sense. Don't you want to save the polar bears? And they're like, not if that means the black people get something. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. don't you want to make it, you know, why aren't you doing this for the housing market? Because we want to make sure that, that the black people don't, don't benefit from this. Every decision that, you know, and the, 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 the comparison between what happened on January 6th and what happened when the peaceful protesters showed up, you know, about a month before, it's an unfair comparison because if you understand the way structural white supremacy works in this country, nothing that happened surprised you. Nothing. And that, stri <laughs> and that strikes me as a mental illness. If you're willing to shoot your own self in the foot so black people don't get squat. That's a problem. That's a mental illness. Well, and the challenge with considering it a mental illness, again, opens the door for um, sympathy and excuses. Sympathy, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, you know the, the, the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders is, the, is what defines what a mental illness is. And racism has never been studied. There were black psychologists in the 70s. Alvin um, Boussant, the one that, that the famous black psychologist was writing letters trying to get the psychological community to actually study 
empirically study racism. Is this a mental illness? They've refused to do it. And so because they have refused to do it, we can't talk about it as a mental illness because it is not. And the danger of talking about it as a mental illness sets up the same disparities that you see between the war on drugs and the opioid crisis. How we, and, and the, the response is completely different. We're looking at um, the way that we talk about um, marijuana criminalization. You know, Virginia just decriminalized marijuana, asterisks here and there, and the black people, you know, I'm, I'm Generation X. I remember when black people understood that if you were driving on 95 in the 80s and the 90s, you were going to get stopped. You were going to get stopped. You were going to get stopped. Mm -hmm. And there are still black people that are in jail right now. From those because stops. On marijuana charges. On marijuana charges from those stops. You're absolutely and, right. And yet our Virginia General Assembly decriminalized marijuana and has set up a process for the Commonwealth of Virginia to create a business of selling you marijuana. And they told us that the black and brown people who are still in jail on marijuana charges are there because the legislature did not have time <laughs> to put that into the bill. Oh, but they had more than enough time to rewrite voter registration laws that? and present those on the floor. How about they that? had all the time in the world to get that stuff done. Though. How about that? Yeah. What, what do you say? Watch whiteness work. If, if you understand <laughs> white what? supremacy, none of this is a surprise. I mean, it's not. I know when I, on for January 6th, I, I, I literally prepared myself for January 6th. I was not shocked at all. No. Me neither. I was waiting for it, as, as a matter I, of fact. As soon as I saw them gathering yeah, for, the, for the speech. For the speech itself, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. And I went and I got me some popcorn and a ginger ale. And I'm not lying. I literally did that. I got me a couple of bags of popcorn so and put them in a bowl after I popped them. And I sat on my bed and I watched January 6th like it was moving because I knew what was going to happen. And then I knew how they were going to treat them after the fact, which is how they're treated. But you know, it, but it's, and it's, and it's, it's not a movie. And, and what's disturbing to me about the whole situation is it wasn't taken seriously. They were talking for months about what they were getting ready to do. Mm -hmm. And my daughter works on the Hill. She had to, it, I was like, what you're not going to do is go to work on January 6th. I know that's right. Every, and so she our... had to take personal leave to not be in the office. Mm -hmm. And and the challenge then becomes, then they put up fences and they've got armed National Guard walking around with AK-15s. And they're Black people who have to go to work walking past these armed guards. Like, and feel uncomfortable while it's happening. Mm -hmm. Can you possibly feel comfortable mm -hmm. with the history of this country and, and let alone walking past, uh, what is it, the, the Capitol Police officers who opened the gates and who let them opened in. the gates to come in. You're yep. absolutely right. You're absolutely and, right. And again, no one who understands the history of white supremacy in this country was surprised by this because we know the history of Medgar Evers. We know about Clyde Kennard that got sent to uh, Parchman Penitentiary for stealing chicken feed and we know that he was framed and the guy admitted it and they still wouldn't let him out of jail. Yeah. Like, these things just continue to happen. And I think the only way we move forward is we reframe the narrative. I don't, it's interesting because you, you show whatever I used to, I, I have relatives, I have, I have community members that are featured in the, in the community footage on Eyes on the Prize and, you know, old civil rights. Um, videos and I used to always wonder like if I know your name who are those rabid white people screaming in the background that's somebody's grandmother you know shout out to the lady that lied about Emmett Till whistling at her who was still alive who's still alive you know, get get go deep into that who's still alive and untouched alive? and untouched and because they, they won't call they won't call her out they won't they won't put her on it's trial they won't do it's, any of those things it's worse than that because when the the person and this is my other challenge with this history because we have white historians coming in to tell our stories and they uncover things like carolyn bryant lied 
and he sit, he, he sat on it for 10 years. Yeah. And then when it came out in the book and somebody said, wait a minute, you mean she lied? And she admitted she lied and you knew this for 10 years? Yep. And then they said, well, she's too old for us to really do anything about that. Exactly. Oh, but Bill Cosby wasn't. And I'm not defending him. I'm it's not no defending defense. him. That's I'm right. I'm saying he's not old enough to be put in jail, but she is. Right. Yes. And, and that, so that's that, what you're saying. And, and, and I so get that. I really, I get it, that. It's just ridiculous. And that's where, when, when you talk about feeling sympathy and seeing their humanity, I understand what it would be to be an 80, 90 year old white woman who is now facing possible criminal charges in jail time. I'd be terrified. But I also understand Emmett Till was terrified too. And, and, I, and, and so when I, and because the way we are conditioned to comfort white people when we allow that conversation to be prioritized around their humanity and their feelings around this, what gets pushed out of the center is the justice that the needs justice to happen. The justice that needs to happen. Because her words led to a horrific death. Yeah. And I'm sure that that was not a quick death. No, no. By he, any he went through it. Emmett, he, he went Emmett through Till it. was my father's age. But the thing that bothers me as far as Emmett Till is concerned, is when the, uh, what they call her? Peggy, the Bodega, Pe Bodega Kathy, or whatever her name was. Oh, but the one, Betty. Bodega, Bo Bodega <laughs> Betty. Mm -hmm. yeah, the she fact that you have to be more specific is something else. <laughs> which one are you talking about? Okay, so I'm getting ready to tell you which one I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one who said that baby touched her butt. It's the one in New York. In New York. She was in a bodega. I think the kid was 13 he, or 14. He wasn't that old. Oh, he wasn't even that old. He wasn't. He was not a teenager yet. But his backpack. But his some, backpack rubbed against her, her butt. Backside. Yep. And she went off. And she was like, he did this and he did. It was the, it was literally Emmett Till all over again. Mm -hmm. It was, li and I'm looking at this like, oh my God, if they touch that baby, I'm going to have to go on and, and go into Ninja or the mode. woman, Or the woman in Central Park. Who phoned the police in hysteria on the lying, black, on, lying the on the phone just because a black man's like he's coming need, for me. You need to put your dog on the lead. That's all he said. And then it's just dude. You need to help me. He's coming for me. He's attacking me. You're lying. You're literally And that's kind of what Adrian that's not kind of. That's what Adrian's <sighs> saying. White people know they can do do that. Now yeah. there are those who would never but it's kind of but out there. Are, but, but it's kind of out there. And you know, I realized I was reading um looking for some storybooks to give my brand new youngest nephew. So I'm looking at all the classic children's tales like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And I'm like, well, that's white privilege right there. This chick feels she can go into these bears' houses, <laughs> eat their food, sleep on their bed. And then it's like, wait a minute, you got a problem that I, I'm in your house. Um, this is where and if I they had be. put paws on her. So you start, so you <laughs> right, start, if they <laughs> had put hands on her, it would have been a problem. So you actually start learning about that from... But the people don't condition. But people it's don't realize that. Yeah, I mean, the condition is there in every way, in every, in every way. It's is there, and that's why I said, Adrian, don't think that I don't agree with you because I do. Mm -hmm. I really do. I and I and I hear that, and you know, the interesting thing about it is, even in my own work, like this is like telling a fish that their water, is the, the water in the goldfish bowl is dirty. Like <laughs> we've been breathing this in and out for so long, we can't even see it. And so what I wanna do is for us to continue challenging the way that we process things. Mm -hmm. You know, when we were growing up, we were taught about slaves, not being enslaved. Mm -hmm. And right. I, you know, being enslaved, and there are people that argue we shouldn't be worried about mm -hmm. semantics. And I said, it matters. Because the responsibility then becomes, it you know, That's the right. slave needs to overcome their condition versus the enslaved need to look at what is the dynamic within your life yeah. that, that this type of horrific treatment is justified. Yeah. Well, we are at a close. We are at a close. <laughs> um, thank fun. you. Thank you. This hour is blown by us. 
I didn't even get a chance to ask some of the other core questions. Because we just went into everything. So, but Adrian, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the work that you do and for the enthusiasm that you brought to the show. Yeah. And do you have a, a, a website to be a part of whatever it is you do? Yeah, I would send everybody to 16greats.com. Okay. That's one six greats.com to see the TED Talk and um, to look at. I also had an interview with the um, National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, and there, my framework is there and there is some other information there. And if you were interested in, you know, one of, one of the things that I do with coaching is to help people process this. Um, and so whether you are dealing with the guilt or, you know, the horror of it, um, there's some information there about uh, connecting with me if you were interested in having a coaching conversation. Excellent. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Next week Thank is you. our second book club. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the Fanny Campbell book about life on a Georgia plantation. And remember, she was an English ac- actress who married Pierce Meese, Pierce Meese Butler in Georgia. So I'm not going to spoil the book if you haven't read it yet, but please do. It's next week. We'll be here Sunday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the book is available to download for free on the Genealogy Adventures website. Just go to our reading room. You'll see Fanny Campbell, Life on a Georgia Plantation. It'll take you to the PDF download. And um, bring your questions, bring your your thoughts, and bring your comments. And bring your tea, because I'm going to have some tea that day. And bring your tea. (laughs) So until next Sunday, and again, thank you so much, Adrian. Till next Sunday, I'm Brian. And I'm Danya, and this is Genealogy Adventures. Bye. See you.